Good evening, everybody. And I'm delighted to welcome you all to our very special Zoom talk this evening to celebrate the centenary of Shir Kalen, the Phantom Carriage. Very special welcome to our speaker, Dr. Claire Thompson, to our members and guests, CELTA members, Peter Lundberg, the cultural attache at the Swedish Embassy, and representatives from the Nordic Press. Dr. Claire Thompson is an Associate Professor of Scandinavian Film at University College London, where she is the Director of Film Studies, but she also keeps one foot in Scandinavian studies. Her research interests lie primarily in Danish cinema and her major publications include the books uh, Thomas Winterberg's Festen, published in 2013, and short films from a small nation Danish Informational Cinema, 1935 to 1965, which was published in 2018. She has recently co-edited The History of Danish Cinema, which will be published next year by Edinburgh University Press. But Claire has also written on various aspects of Swedish cinema, ranging from Ingmar Bergman's unrealized film projects to the use of film in public health campaigns a class on the Phantom Carriage was the first thing she ever taught back in 1998. And this wonderful film has haunted her all her teaching. I'm delighted um, to welcome Claire. And so over to you. Thank you very much indeed. And, and, and thank you for this invitation. Uh, it's as, as Robert just said, this is a film that I've been talking about for 22 years. And um, I've used it in teaching, I think, almost every year since 1998. Uh, and students usually love it. You know, if this is a film that they've not seen before, uh, they, they, they come away with their, their thoughts on Scandinavian cinema history transformed. Um, so I don't know how many of you have actually been able to to watch the film in advance. It's not as though we can uh, pile into a cinema these days, um, but maybe soon that will be possible. But I will just say that the, the film is available on, on YouTube um, in, in a couple of different places actually. Uh, so it shouldn't be too hard to get hold of. And it's also available in a couple of different DVD editions, one of which I just happen to have on my desk. Uh, this one is uh, the Tartan DVD edition from I think 2008, but as uh, Robert was, was mentioning, there is, there's also a Criterion Collection one as well. So this is a film that's still very much uh, in, in circulation, but we are indeed celebrating its, uh, its 100th anniversary around now. We're celebrating it uh, exactly a month too early because it was premiered on, on New Year's Day 1921 uh, in, in Stockholm. I'm going to be showing quite a lot of slides. I suppose I've accumulated quite a lot of slides on, the, on this film over the years. I tried not to make them too wordy. Uh, they're, they're mostly pictures. But what I'm going to do now is uh, share my screen. Um, and what will then tend to happen is that you'll see the slides in the middle of your screen and you might be able to see the pictures of a few attendees um, on one side of the screen. So if I was uh, presenting from my office and not my living room, uh, you might well see this poster in the background uh, because this is uh, one of the, the original posters uh, from the, the Swedish premiere. And as you can see right away, this is a film um, which at the time was attributed not just to its director, Victor Hörström. I have to apologize in advance um, as a Scottish and Danish speaker for my Swedish pronunciation, please don't laugh. Um, but Selma Lagerlöf, of course, is, is the one who gets her name uh, at the top of the poster. What I'm going to be talking about for the next 40 minutes or so is split into three sections. Um, and the first one is uh, called the masterpiece. So we'll have a, a look at um, the adaptation of the film from Selma Lagerlöf's text of the same name. And I'll say a little bit about the uh, production and the premiere back uh, 100 years ago, almost exactly. And then I'll move on to say something about the, the context. So Swedish cinema or Scandinavian cinema more generally from the earliest films to uh, the golden age. It's all, always a bit dangerous to talk about golden ages, um, but this truly was uh, a golden age for Swedish cinema when, when Sweden punched well above its weight uh, on the world stage. And um, then lastly, uh, I'll say a few things about the, the legacy of, of the film, both its cinematic impact 
uh, and also its, its educational impact. And I'm sure actually that you'll be able to say more than, than I can um, about the film's legacy uh, on those of you with a Swedish upbringing perhaps, or cinema buffs. So I hope that that third section will segue nicely into a uh, discussion um, and, and questions. Okay, so to turn to, to section one, and that is um, adaptation, production and reception. Here is um, Victor Perström, except as you might be able to see, he's signing his name on this photo as Seastrom. Uh, he, had, he had two identities because he did move to, to work in, in Hollywood for a while in the 1920s and his name was of course unpronounceable and so he adapted it to, to Seastrom. So you might well see this director um, discussed under both names. And you will also recognize this face immediately if you've seen The Phantom Courage because uh, he also has the, the lead role that was quite common in those days for um, film folk to be both directors, screenwriters and, and actors. Um, and he was also an acclaimed actor. This was not just a, a vanity project. But of course, there are other faces behind this film. Um, the one on the left needs no introduction, I think, Selma Lagerlöf. Um, the, uh, the author of the novella and Sweden's uh, first female winner of the Nobel Prize for, for Literature. But on the right, um, a less well-known face, and that is the, the cinematographer, Julius Jensen, um, sometimes credited as J. Julius, um, presumably because his, his surname was also rather awkward. So I think it's really important that, that we give him credit as well as a kind of co-author of, of this film because his uh, his... His cinematic techniques, um, his uh, pioneering work on double exposure um, and various aspects of, of post-production really make the film look as it does and indeed in discussions of, of the time uh, the cinematographer gets a lot of the credit, perhaps not quite as much as, as director um, and author behind the text. So as, as we know, um, the film The Phantom Carriage was adapted from uh, a novella by the same name by Selma Lagerlöf and that novella had been published in 1912 uh, just a, a couple of years after she got her, her Nobel Prize and the, the novella is uh, first and foremost a, a, a beautiful read it's a very slim book um, absolutely beautifully structured and uh, it's available in English translation by Peter Graves who coincidentally or not was indeed um, my tutor at the University of Edinburgh who entrusted me with his seminar on the Phantom Carriage back in, in 1998. So uh, <laughs> this, is, this is all very um, cyclical. Um, full disclosure, I am a director of, of Norvik Press which published the English language translation. I'm not trying to make money because we are a not-for-profit organisation. I just want to make you aware that an English language translation um, is currently in print and available from all good bookstores, as they say. But whether you're reading in um, Swedish or in, in English, um, what you will notice if, if you read the novella alongside the film is that um, the biggest challenge for the film really was to deal with the very complex structure of the novel. We can think of it perhaps as, as more of a spatial structure uh, where we start um, at midnight on a particular New Year's Eve um, and the film kind of unfolds from there rather than, um, than unfolding linearly. Uh, it folds out backwards and, and forwards as well, but it's structured around the idea of, of the turn of the year. Now, another aspect of the adaptation that, uh, that Hörström had to pay careful attention to was the mixture of mysticism and realism in Lagerlöf's novel. Um, now that's, that's quite interesting because of course, she, she was a writer who was, was good at ghost stories and folk tales and, and, and so on. That's, that was part of, of what she did. And, and this is a ghost story par excellence. But it's also a, a very social realist novella um, in terms of its style uh, and its content. It's, it, it's trying to capture the misery of um, tuberculosis, which at that time was, was killing um, many thousands of, of Scandinavians every year. I'm going to come back to tuberculosis right at the end. And uh, in fact, the, the novella had been commissioned by an organization called, um, let me see if I can get this right, Svenska 
Nationale Vereinigung mot Tuberkulos, the Swedish National Association Against Tuberculosis. And she had founded that a couple of years earlier, um, along with um, uh, the Crown Prince um, and some other famous figures. Um, and what that organization was, was meant to do was to, um, to really uh, ramp up fundraising uh, and, and ramp up awareness of um, scientific research uh, battling tuberculosis. So the, the novel deliberately deals with um, the problem of, of tuberculosis and its impact, but it also connects tuberculosis very closely to, uh, to poverty and to alcoholism and, and to other social problems. And this was a, a beloved and, and, and well-read novel in, in Sweden, um, as well as in, in translation across the world. And so Törström, in, in adapting it to film, had to get all of this right in a convincing way. He had to serve the art of literature as well as the art of cinema. And uh, he also had to um, please Lagerlöf, I suppose. Uh, the story goes that Fjöström, in an effect of inspiration, actually adapted the original text to the film manuscript in, in about a week in spring 1920. And he then took it to Lagerlöf um, and they worked on the screenplay together. And Lagerlöf, in fact, had been quite sceptical um, about the, well, about film as, as a medium. Um, she did not regard it as, as an improving medium. Um, she thought of it as something potentially harmful and, and certainly not an art form that was on a par with, with cinema. Now, that was back uh, in the 1910s. And by the time um, she had seen the finished film, The Phantom Carriage, in fact, she had changed her mind. And, and we might say that she had changed her mind really because of, of Victor Sjöström and his crew's skill in, in adaptation um, and the, their attention to, to her narrative as well. Now, on this slide, um, I've, I've put an English translation uh, in the printed large at the top, and then there's a very small Swedish text at, at, at the bottom. Um, I'm not sure if we can perhaps come to some arrangement where the slides can be shared afterwards with anybody who, who wants them. So if you do want to go into the details of the text and the references and so on, I'm, I'm very happy to, to share those, but it may not be coming through very well on your Zoom screens. Um, so I'll read this aloud. This is a, a letter that Lagerlöf wrote to Hörström after she had seen his film. Now this film has safely reached port, and this time the excellent work you put into it as an author, director and actor will be fully appreciated. And it does seem as if you have not only paved the way for Swedish films, but also for my books. I think you'll be amused to hear that films can also boost books. Actually, in terms of boosting her books, what she was talking about was the, the Anglophone market. Um, she was very conscious that the, uh, the, the global circulation of the film uh, would give a, bo a boost to her book sales. And there's more discussion of, of Lagerlöf's conversion to cinema uh, in um, uh, an English language uh, book chapter, which Bjarne Thompson in Edinburgh wrote um, about 15 years ago, uh, which is referenced there on the slide. That's in a book called Northern Constellations. So if we then, we probably want to know uh, what it is that uh, pleased Lagerlöf so and what it was that pleased Swedish audiences so at the time. And so in case there are people who in fact haven't seen the film or maybe you need your, your memory refreshed a little bit, I thought we'd, we'd start off before going any further with a short clip from the film. This is about five minutes in length. And I picked this one because it's, um, it's really at the center of, of the film. Again, if I can talk in terms of space rather than time, we meet um, the main character, David Holm, in a graveyard where he has been drunkenly fighting with a couple of other um, alcoholics. Uh, and it's, it's midnight on New Year's Eve. And his friends have just managed to kill him, apparently. And so we see him um, rising from his, his corpse and meeting with a figure who looks like death, but is actually the driver of the phantom carriage, i.e. a carriage which um, drives around collecting the dead, um, as, as we shall see. And this is something that is, is shown in, in double exposure. But what this clip also shows is how this visiting figure um, encourages uh, David Holland to, to look back on his life and what we see unfolding before us is, is a, ha a happy life with wife and children and brother which is ruined by his meeting with um, a bunch of no, no good alcoholics um, in, in a field. 
So what you'll see then is um, the way that the film structures time, the way that it structures cause and effect. You'll see that um, it is in fact not a black and white film at all. It's tinted uh, in a range of different colors to, to, uh, to signify um, different times of day, different periods in, in history. That's a, a color language that we no longer speak. You'll see intertitles in Swedish. Um, so I'll give a, a quick translation um, of, of what's there, but I'm sure most of you don't actually need that. Um, and you'll also notice uh, that uh, there, there is music, um, but this is not the original music. So this is really just incidental background music, as far as I can hear, it's the, the Matty Boo score, which was produced um, in around uh, 2008, I think. Okay, so let's just watch this um, with a, a little commentary from me, and I think this will give you uh, enough of a taste of the film um, to, to help us go forward. No, David, is it you? It's you who has to uh, relieve me of my duties. You should lift me up in your carriage and take me to the hospital as fast as you can. No living person travels in that carriage. When I arrive at a sick bed, it's too late to call on another doctor. You know just as well as I do that <clears throat> I, who am talking to you now, am not living. But the worst thing is that you had to uh, meet the, the consequences of the evil which you have uh, wrought uh, while you've been alive here on earth. Do you think I don't know, David, that it's my fault that you have met this end? If you had not met me, you would have lived a quiet and happy life together with your wife, your children and your brother. And now we're going back into the pink world of memory.
so that last little tableau there is it's, it's quite beautiful isn't it it, it turns into a, a, a some kind of um Rembrandt or, or, or something as one of the uh, as one of the reviewers said at the time that's one of the central sequences in, in the film because it gives us an explanation as to to why David Holm and his brother went down the path of, of alcoholism um, and tuberculosis and left the wife and children um, in peril um, but a lot of my students uh, when I show this they they don't understand the cause and effect and in fact the, the the film leaves this very implicit there's just a fade to black between the the, the lovely rose world of uh, the happy family and um, and the miserable fate that awaits them but that fade to black follows um, a, a very short shot of, of three um, merry looking um, tramps enjoying their beer in the same field uh, as as the as David Holm and, and his family, and so the implication is that they met each other that day, or just that they were somehow uh, in the same social sphere, and the the link between alcohol uh, and, and misery, I think, would have, would have been um, obvious enough to to audiences at the time for the film actually not to articulate um, what has happened. Now that's just five minutes, a very important five minutes uh, of a film that was roughly two hours long. And there's one important character that you didn't see in that clip, um, and that is um, the uh, Salvation Army sister, Sister Edith, uh, who is actually the, the first uh, person that we see in the film. She's lying on her deathbed. She's been stricken with galloping consumption, i.e. tuberculosis. And we later learn that she has caught this tuberculosis from, from David Holm uh, a year earlier um, when she had welcomed him into uh, into the refuge that she had that she had set up in the slums of the city uh, and her mission her her last wish is to find David Holm and to tell him something very important now I'm not going to tell you what that very important thing is because that would be that would be a spoiler but roughly speaking those are the the different levels of, of plot that this very complex film deals with um, and you can see the the mixture there then of, of, of social realism and, and mysticism now, the premiere um, was, as we've said, New Year's Day 1921 in Stockholm uh, at the prestigious cinema Röda Kvarn, um, which shockingly I just found out um, today is, uh, is a, um, an urban outfitter shop. Um, it survived all the way into the, the 21st century and then met a horrible fate. But Röda Kvarn had been established as one of Stockholm's finest cinemas uh, in 1915. So it was very much a state-of-the-art cinema in, in 1920 and to premiere there on New Year's Day says something about the perceived importance of, of the phantom carriage. As was typical at the time in the larger, fancier uh, cinemas, um, there was a live orchestra and they played um, specially composed pieces by Ture Rangström, Swedish composer, and also other pieces by Mendelssohn, Sans, Science and others. And the, the company uh, behind the film, we'll come back to the company presently, um, claims that The Phantom Carriage was seen by almost 100,000 Stockholmers in the space of the next two months. That may be a bit of an exaggeration. Um, but we do, we do know that it premiered over the next year in London, Paris, Vienna and New York. And so um, Victor Sostrom uh, and Selma Lagerlöf, in fact, uh, became uh, if not household names, then certainly well known um, all over the world. And what the, the reviewers said um, at home was, was overwhelmingly positive, um, as it was worldwide as well. So just uh, one uh, newspaper review can stand as an example. The finished drama emerges as nothing less than an artwork, gripping as a play, as true as a biography, enlightening as a homily, a brilliant example of what Swedish film art can achieve when it is practiced seriously. And I like that last sentence because it really does sum up a lot of the commentary of the time. This was not just about a fantastic story. It was not just about the, the technical achievements of Julius Jensson. Um, it was about elevating Swedish film as an art rather than as, as cheap entertainment. And so we can see um, The Phantom Carriage as, as a really, um, if not the first film of the, of the Swedish Golden Age, um, certainly the most important one. Hi, Paul. Oh, what was that? I think somebody might need to mute. <laughs> um, 
I just wanted to give you an, a, a sense of how, what these premieres would have looked and, and, and felt like. Also in, in London, though the film had been shown at a trade fair in February 1920, it got a premiere the next New Year's Day um, at the, the Alhambra New Year's Day 1922. So perhaps we should come back and celebrate again in another year. Um, as, as Londoners, but uh, this is a, um, a, a lovely image of the Alhambra in the snow. Um, it's an, it was in Leicester Square, but no longer exists. And then uh, in the US, um, the, the film had a different English title, not The Phantom Carriage, but Thy Soul Shall Bear Witness. And this is, uh, a, this is the front page of the, the quite lavish programme that um, American film goers would have got. This was also a typical feature of, of big budget films at, at the time that you would get not just a, a one page print as you, you would um, at the British Film Institute, um, but you would get a, a, a booklet um, with some lovely illustrations and um, articles like these. Um, so in the American program, cinema goers would have read a few words about Dr. Selma Lagerlöf and uh, about Victor Schoestrom uh, and about the themes of, of the film and so on. And quite often these programmes also contain a lot of information about the, the technical aspects of, of filmmaking. So the, the cinema going experience, of course, was not just sitting watching the film. It actually had quite a lot of, of material around it for, for people to absorb. And in the bigger cinemas, it, it would have been a, a multi-sensory experience with, with beautiful music and um, fine snacks. Um, some of them had childcare facilities. Uh, cinema going was uh, a big business uh, and an important aspect of, of culture, not least in Sweden. So let's think a bit more about um, the context from which this film emerges. Um, and I will, of course, mostly be talking about Sweden, but the same sorts of observations apply to Scandinavian cinema generally. Um, we can start with uh, a word from the Danish auteur Carl Dreyer, um, whom I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, he was a huge fan of Victor Sjöström um, and wrote um, in 1920, so just after he'd seen The Phantom Carriage uh, in, in Denmark, that on the ladder that signifies the evolution of film as a factor of culture, Swedish film has placed the latest rung. There are many who look upon film grudgingly but it's precisely through the merits of the Swedish film that they grow fewer in number with each day that passes. And only in this way has film the prospect of gradually gaining full citizenship in the community of arts. And of Hörström, he says specifically, um, we can't mention Swedish film without mentioning Victor Hörström's name in the same breath. He understood as well that the much coveted film excitement could be obtained without using revolvers, jumps from the fifth floor and similar sensationalisms. He understood that genuine excitement exists in all good dramatic material, and he began to search amongst the most outstanding works of, of literature, particularly Selma Lagerlöf. So we can see then that in Carl Dreyer's journalism, Carl Dreyer went on to have a very illustrious career as, as a film auteur, but at this point he'd made just a couple of films and was working as a, a journalist. He, he is really um, engaging with the idea that cinema was on the cusp of becoming a respectable art form. Uh, especially in so far as it was engaging with and adapting uh, national literature, canonical literature, as opposed to, uh, to just providing cheap entertainment for people, um, and that Sjöström is, is playing an important role in this. Where had cinema been? I mean, Dreyer writing there in 1920 uh, has 25 years of cinema history to play with. This is a new art form. Um, we can compare it to um, you know, CGI, computer generated imagery emerging about 25 years ago. Um, so it's, it's an, uh, an art form and a business that is really still in its early stages. It's still a silent art film. But um, 1895 um, is the year that's, that's usually given. The French insist on this, that 1895 was the year that moving images emerged. There are other claims, <laughs> but let's take the French year 1895. And we can trace how quickly this new equipment, this new technology spread north into Scandinavia. And in fact, in, in all of the Scandinavian capitals, uh, film screenings took place um, as early as 1896. And it makes sense, doesn't it, that the first film screenings in Sweden would take place in Malmö, because that's the, the most southerly town um, closely connected to, to Copenhagen. And so film culture is, is spreading northwards. 
And it's then also the case that it's Malmö that initially becomes the centre of this nascent Swedish film industry. Um, pioneer called Franz Lundberg, another called Charles Magnusson, um, who established Svenska Bio, were very influenced by the uh, Danish melodramas pouring out of Copenhagen. Um, there had been a couple of film entrepreneurs making films in Copenhagen since the late 1890s. And the Swedes were much more worried about this though than the Danes were. Um, uh, there was a, a big debate about the corrupting effects of film on children, which of course Lagerlöf herself was, uh, was engaged in. And um, anecdotally, the Biograph Bureau, the censorship office, uh, was established in Stockholm in 1911, a very early form of censorship office and known as the world's strictest censor. Um, operations of Svenska Bio, the film company, moved to Stockholm in 1911. And then another important development is 1919, just before uh, The Phantom Carriage was made, when the very recognisable Svensk film industry, you'll recognise that logo there on the left, uh, formed uh, from a merger of, of two of the early uh, Malmö-based companies. So it's quite interesting that um, the, the centre of operations in Malmö moved, moved northwards, um, and I think that also helped with film becoming much more of an art form, um, as much more plugged into to Swedish cultural life. There are some wonderful resources these days uh, provided by filmarchivet.se. Um, you can see the very first, the very earliest uh, films recorded in Sweden, um, one by the uh, German, or I think he was Austrian actually, Max Gladnowski, and this is just some comic events in the Tiergarten, the Duerheim, I forget what that's called. Um, and then some footage from the Stockholm exhibition of 1897. So that's um, a couple of links, but you can also just visit filmarchivit.se and search for topics that you're interested in. There's also a fantastic resource that's just been launched um, by the Danish Film Institute. And of course, this focuses on early Danish cinema, um, but they've been digitizing everything in sight uh, and featuring um, a lot of interesting articles as well for anybody who'd like to explore this era further. We can say um, that this very early cinema is very different from film as we recognise that. Uh, and I'm emphasising this because the storytelling in The Phantom Courage is so important. Around the turn of the century, we, we would talk about cinema as early cinema until about 1906, typically. There are two kinds of film, um, both tending to be single shot films lasting maybe 30 seconds, maybe two minutes. And those tend to be divided into actuality, actualities, recording the world as it is, like that film of the Stockholm exhibition. And then trick films, like the comedy film in, uh, in the Stockholm park. And what these types of films have in common in the early days is that they're not interested in narrative really at all. They're interested in what we call spectacle. So um, tricks, moving bodies, horses, cars, flashing lights, um, slightly risque, things like ladies' ankles being seen on the streets of New York. Uh, this, is, this is not a narrative art at the time. And what happens through the, the 1910s, um, don't worry about all these points on here, I'm recycling my teaching slides, but it, they might be of interest, is that we can talk about the cinema of narrative integration, i.e. through the 1910s, cinema as an art form integrates narrative. So it becomes a storytelling art um, as we would recognize it. And there are several um, things to note there. Um, the first stage is to make multi-shot films. So sticking initially three shots together to tell a story. And then storytelling starts to dominate from around 1908. Audiences like this, human beings are storytelling creatures after all. And so they demand um, more and more sophisticated stories and more sophisticated productions and they're willing to pay money for these tickets. So the way to make films longer and thus more complex is to use more than one reel of film. The Phantom Carriage uh, I believe had six reels um, so coming in at roughly two hours in length and those reels would often be screened with a break in between. So The Phantom Carriage uh, in some versions has, has six chapters as it were. And in between, you could you could have a break while the new reel was was loaded up into the projector, unless it was a sophisticated cinema with two projectors, and then one reel could be loading um, as the next as the previous one was um, was playing. So that's that's a really important technological invention. 
we have this move towards adapting literature and adapting classical myth and so on, which, uh, which also makes storytelling and characterization more complex. And acting becomes increasingly naturalistic and less theatrical. The Phantom Carriage, uh, the clip that you've just seen, the acting probably still looks rather um, theatrical, but it's, uh, that's relatively naturalistic for the time. Um, and the other thing that happens is that increasingly elaborate picture palaces are built. Um, it's buildings specifically where people would go and, and see several films of, of, of an evening, uh, just like Rue de Clan. The other thing I would mention here, um, because it's not always obvious, is that as narrative becomes more complex, actually there's quite a lot of verbal information going into films as well. And this is um, usually in the form of intertitles. There is no film sound until 1927, as we know. Um, and so the intertitles are, are edited, they're cut uh, into in between the pictures. And the art of understanding a film through its intertitles as well as through its, its pictures is of course a skill that, that we've lost. So we can see that the, the rhythm and the structure of storytelling in film is, is, is very different um, all the way through the, the 1920s. And that has implications for, for literary adaptation as well. Swedish film is um, being distributed all over the world at this time. I have uh, shamelessly stolen uh, a map here um, from a book that I would highly recommend though. Um, it's called A Companion to Nordic Cinema. Um, a wonderful large book uh, also available as an ebook. But in this particular chapter, um, the author, Laura Horak, is looking at the distribution of film prints made by Sven Scabio between 1915 and 1918. And I think you can just about see um, that uh, the, the black areas there, and so very varied countries, Russia, Germany, Sweden, the UK, um, are getting large numbers of, of prints exported from Sweden. There's, there's a possibly, in fact, it's not apocryphal at all, there's evidence that the Russian market demanded gloomier endings and so companies, including the Swedish companies, would make alternative endings to their films for the Russian market. But I, I don't think there was a gloomier Phantom Carriage ending. Um, but I'm not 100% sure. Through the 1910s then, Sweden is producing literary adaptations, and the most important of which probably is Terje Vegan. That's a little bit controversial because here we have a national text by Ibsen um, being adapted by guess who? Victor Hörström, a Swedish filmmaker. Uh, and he did it so well again that the Norwegians were, were won over. So that's a little parallel story to Selma Lagerlöf being won over. And he had also directed uh, a number of, of Lagerlöf texts, um, Ingeborg Holm and his uh, compatriot Maurits Stiller had directed Herr Arnes Penninger. There's a whole list of, of Lagerlöf adaptations in this period. Now, the, the other um, sort of interesting bit, for those of you who are uh, interested in, in film technology, uh, you might want to follow up on this, is that one of the, the stars of the Swedish Golden Age um, was not an actor or a director or a particular film. It was the, the film studios at Rossunda, which, were, um, which emerged as Sweden's Hollywood. Um, and of course, that, that's a kind of deliberate um, adaptation of, of Hollywood that was emerging uh, in the 1920s on the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, the Phantom Carriage was the first feature film to be shot there. Um, it has production number one at Rossunda, uh, but it wasn't the first to be launched uh, precisely because it's post-production. All of the special effects took such a long time to, to achieve. But we do have film footage uh, that gives us some insight into how film studios looked at that time. At the top, there's a, a, this is from a newsreel showing a, a big buffet at Rossunda, and the bottom is, is some aerial footage showing the, the, the scope and size of it. This has actually become a really important part of Sweden's film heritage even today because you can still visit Filmstad and Film City uh, as, a, as a museum. And so if we were to sum up this golden age, we might say that it stars the Swedish landscape, the literary canon, certain leading figures like Charles Magnusson at Svensk, Svensk Film Industry, the film studios, actors and directors like Victor Sjöström, and of course Greta Garbo, uh, who we haven't, we haven't seen, um, but is of course a household name, who also went global. 
So just to finish off, um, I've got a couple of, of suggestions for ways that we might look at the legacy of um, the phantom carriage. On the one hand, uh, Victor Schuster's own career. Uh, here's a poster from probably his most famous American film starring Lillian Gish, in which he is referred to, of course, as, as Victor Seastrom. Uh, he did return to Sweden after that. We can look at the, uh, the impact of images from The Phantom Carriage on a great variety of films, and I'm sure you have some more examples. You'll be able to recognise these, though. On the left, uh, we have um, Ingmar Bergman's The Seventh Seal, and on the right, something that a lot of my students uh, instantly recognise, which is Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. Um, so, but you can see influences in, in everything if you look hard enough. Schoestrom had a particular influence on Ingmar Bergman. Um, and as you, you may know, uh, he starred, in fact, uh, in Bergman's um, mid-1950s uh, mid film, Wild Strawberries, as, as the ageing central character. And is mentioned in, in Bergman's um, book Images, My Life in, in Film. Um, there's also a wonderful interview available on YouTube uh, where Ingmar Bergman talks about the, the impact that Hurston in general and the Phantom Carriage in particular had had on his life as, as a filmmaker. Um, I was also just uh, thinking there about a, a drama, um, a kind of minor piece, one of the last films Bergman made, which is called The Image Makers. Um, and written by Per Olaf Enquist, um, which is a drama set during the, sorry, that's a misprint, I should say, the production of Sher Carlin. And it's a kind of fight between Selma Lagerlöf and, and the leading lady. So that's also worth getting hold of. It's an extra on the Tartan DVD edition. And then we have the film um, inspiring all kinds of musicians, including the Swedish composer Matti Bu, whose music we heard in, in the clip, and also the post-metal band KTL, which you may or may not want to listen to. And finally, because we are where we are in terms of the pandemic, I thought I would end up on a note of some kind of hope, um, which is just to say that, um, as mentioned previously, Lagerlöf was involved in the anti-tuberculosis fight uh, in Sweden. And The Phantom Carriage was part of that. Uh, it was used as an educational film in, in, in schools and it was um, used by the Salvation Army as well as, as a kind of propaganda. But there's also another little PS Strangely enough, her novel Nils Holgersson, which needs no introduction, was also adapted to film, um, but another kind of film, and that was a, an anti-tuberculosis public information film in the early 1950s. Uh, so on the left there, we have a couple of stills from that film showing the two uh, young um, characters in Nils Holgersson who lose their parents to tuberculosis and start tramping through Sweden. Uh, Lila Osa, uh, sorry, Osa, Osa Gosapia and Lilin. Uh, Lila and her brother. Um, and we have uh, some of the fundraising stamps um, for the, uh, the National Association Against Tuberculosis at the bottom. This film's quite optimistic because it's looking back on half a century of tuberculosis research and 10 years of tuberculosis vaccination and mass screening programmes. So 50 years, sorry, no, 70 years on from that, we might want to look back and, and have a little bit of optimism. And I shall stop there. That was wonderful. Well done. <laughs> but, who, but who will ask the first question? I think David, David Goldsmith, please. First of all, that was uh, really lovely. Thank you very much for that. It's always interesting to see how um, art and people can respond to crises of the time. Mm. And you're quite right to say that um, in the 19th century, uh, about 25% of deaths were due to tuberculosis in yeah. Scandinavia. It's the, uh, the absence of sunlight for most of the year, the low vitamin D levels amongst <laughs> other reasons. But uh, the, the, the society, the, uh, the group against tuberculosis was actually responsible for a lot of fantastic work mm -hmm. and research. And Sweden was the place where one of the earliest drugs that was successfully used in tuberculosis was actually discovered partly by accident as usually is the case with uh, anti-infective things and partly by design. Mm. So it's fantastic to see that all that hard work and some great art and films have uh, developed the, the progress of medicine at the same time. Absolutely. And I, uh, the, um, 
it, it wouldn't be wrong to say that my interest in lager life actually comes through the tuberculosis because my main interest is public information films. I'm working quite a lot at the moment on public health films. And so I went back into Sweden's pioneering work on, on mass screening programmes as well. And strangely enough, I started this um, about a year before the pandemic started. So I know far too much about lungs and vaccination programmes for my own good. Thank you very much. I enjoyed it enormously. Oh, but you're welcome. Thank you. I, I wondered why he made the film so long. Even today, two hours is um, sort of rare. Mm. And you mentioned um, very short films. So how come that out of a short novel, he mm. made such a long film? That's a really good point. Um, I think I can answer it by looking back at that uh, period in the 1910s, which, which we call the cinema of narrative integration, and the length of films was being experimented with. So you'd moved from films of 30 seconds around 1900 through to films of about 40 minutes to reelers by about 1910. And then there's a period when they get longer and longer. So you, you the, the most successful films um, like Birth of a Nation, you know, for better or worse. And some of the, the, the big Italian dramas were three hours long, four hours long, I think some of them were. But you could get away with that because of these breaks. Um, and some of them were shown as, as, as serial style screenings as well. So it's not really until more recently that the, the length of a film at about an hour and a half, something below two hours, um, really, really crystallised. And, and that's just due to audience demand. Well, but, it, but it is a fascinating unusual. thought that such a, such a short novella could create such a long film. Was it unusual in its length at the time? No, I think it was quite usual for a big budget film, actually, that, that had international ambitions. This was supposed to be you know, a big film in every way. Thank you so much, Claire. I can't see you at the moment because I, I can only see myself now <laughs> when I talk. <laughs> anyway. Um, having spent 10 years before I came to, to London at the Swedish Film Institute, I've heard numerous people talk about Körkaren, the phantom carriage before, but this was definitely one of the, the loveliest talks I've, I've heard. And, oh uh, gosh, that's so a well, thank you. Yeah, it was lovely, really nice. And um, uh, well, I've, I've been thinking of something which has to do more with Selma Lagerlöf than Viktor Sjöström. Um, and um, it's, if you look at the phantom carriage today, many things have aged a lot, although I think, I still think it's an amazing film, of course, but you know, technology and, uh, uh, and the theme is also very old fashioned, but something that really uh, strikes me often when I watch new films or TV series, and I can mention The Crown or succession or other uh, very popular TV series is that Lagerlöf's way of telling a story is so much, she was so advanced for her time and it's so much um, something that I see that her style of telling a story is very, very uh, strong today and even even stronger today than, than it was I think in those days, do you do you agree on this, and do you have any thoughts of this yourself? Oh, I I, I don't think I'm qualified to, to pronounce on 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 Lagerlöf really. I mean, it's certainly her um, her experimentation with uh, with with narrative structures is, is is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So I th well, I mean, if if I could answer that maybe from a, a slightly oblique cinematic angle. Yes, please um, do. The, 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 the sorts of um, the, the the kind of what we often refer to as the classical Hollywood style. So the very linear uh, structure of of stories that, that that crystallizes in Hollywood in the nineteen twenties and becomes normal. So you have um, goal driven characters who meet problems along the way, and there's some kind of happy ending. Very basically. Um, that clearly is, is not the kind of story that we would tend to tell these days in any kind of interesting um, visual culture. We're, we're much more experimental when it comes to comes to time and space. And a lot of theorists are now talking in terms of post cinema, where we're actually going back to, to that kind of early cinema um, 
uh, resistance to, to story, um, to, to straightforward narrative as we would understand it. So it might well be that that's, that's, uh, that's what you're responding to, that, that, that there's a kind of experimentation in cause and effect, space and time um, that comes through in these films, precisely because they're there in Lagerlöf's texts. But I think we've got lots of people here who could say much more about Lagerlöf's uh, narrative art than I can. Mm, but it's interesting from a from a film and and these days also TV series drama series perspective I think yeah. and that's something that's really uh, stricken me in the, in the past few years that uh, her way rereading some Lagerlöf books in the co past couple of years I've realized that she was her way of telling stories is something that you can see much more of today in film and uh, and uh, TV series, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah. than you did some 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true, yeah. Mm. Alexandra, it's Robert. Could I just um, say, I thought that was the most marvellous talk. I really enjoyed it. And it, it, I, I learned a lot and a lot of things which I... I have to say, I didn't really understand in the film, I now do understand. So I just uh, want to say, to me, and I don't think it's a spoiler, the most <laughs> shocking part of the film is when David tries to infect his own children. I mean, that, that is truly shocking, but and I don't want to go into it. But there's a story in the Swedish papers today, which doesn't bear repeating, about some school children in a secondary school in um, Sweden, who are deliberately trying to infect other people. So the world is not a better place, and which is terribly sad, that uh, people should think that this, that, that, uh, that is acceptable behavior. Sorry, I think Liz wanted to ask something. Do you want to ask something, Liz? May I say something? Um, I found the ending of that film really quite odd. Uh, but you mustn't um, give any spoilers away. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Well, it goes on a little bit too long, doesn't it? I also thought it was quite religious in a way, mm. that the whole thing seemed to me that at that time, Sweden was actually quite religious. And um, I don't know if it still is, but I mean, it certainly came across as being heavily loaded that way to me. And I couldn't quite work out, uh, I'm not allowed to say about the end, am I? No. Well, I think leave, leave, leave the end, just gloss over it. <laughs> work out what's happening with sort of muddle at the end when everyone was smashing everything up you know um, I think we could give away what the last line is let my yeah, soul write the, the last line is, is rather rather mm. lovely actually yeah. mm. but I'm so, so, something that um sorry I don't, don't want to sort of ask too many questions but something that I, I found quite interesting was that in, in until uh, certainly fairly recently uh Sweden was 99.9% .9 Lutheran, which is extraordinary. And obviously the uh, coming in of uh, people from abroad has changed that statistic enormously. And also the, the fact people don't go to church in the same way as they did. But what was the influence of Salvation Army? Did it work with the Lutheran church or was it a separate competitive organization? It was a Christian organization. Yeah, but. I think that the Salvation Army was quite heavily involved in um, the tuberculosis prevention. Oh. So I think it's there not as much as not as much to convert people to join the Salvation Army as as, uh, as just just a form of realism because it we, makes sense we, that the the Salvation Army would would be um, would be heavily involved in this world where tuberculosis was rampant. Were they um, nurses or semi nurses? Do you think? Uh, yeah, they're play, playing a role as nurses, but um, there are two female characters known as sisters who, uh, who yeah. are running a, a, a refuge uh, for, uh, for, 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 for the homeless or, or for alcoholics, and they open it on the previous New Year's Eve. A slum. <laughs> David Holm uh, arrives and he's extremely badly behaved. It's almost worth watching the film just for his behaviour on that occasion. Oh, that's incredible. I did feel that. That's where the two worlds would coincide, isn't it? Because the poverty and deprivation, the crowding, uh, would be the place where the Salvation Army would be involved, trying to help those poor indigent people. And that's exactly the same place where the tuberculosis would be running right, a riot rather in the, in the city centres, yeah, uh, etc. So it, it can come together that way. Yeah. 
And actually, the way that the uh, that the Salvation Army sister is infected with tuberculosis, the, the, the way that that's framed, again, I won't spoil it for you, has actually quite a lot to tell us about why we should be wearing masks. Yeah. <laughs> we, have, we have a question from Ian uh, Giles. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, hi, Claire. Thanks for hi, the talk. Ian. Really great fun. Um, you talked a bit about the legacy, but of course, there's, there's a lot of legacy in a lot of years. We're, we're here for the hundredth birthday. Um, what's the what's the legacy now? And and has the film coming out of copyright changed anything? Has it made it more common? I work on Hampson's Growth of the Soil, which is a contemporary of this, and people always seem a bit shocked that it's kind of disappeared, more or less, both as a movie and as a novel. Yeah, well, I was wondering about that, actually, and, and maybe, maybe maybe Pia can, can tell us, because I couldn't find any evidence. There have been a few DVD editions, but I couldn't find any evidence of the film having been kind of restored in a very public way, in the way that, for example, the um, uh, Terry Vegan uh, was, was restored and, and, and recolorized. Uh, so it's, it's probably, uh, but, but Pia knows. Do you? I, I, do, I do know that the, the film archive at the Swedish Film Institute has made a new digitized version, completely restored of the film. Okay. And there is also new music for that film. And um, it's supposed to be beautiful. I haven't had the chance to see it myself, but um, I tried to uh, contact the Film Institute, or I did contact them and uh, Svensk Film Industry um, earlier this autumn because of this webinar and um, wanting to get hold of that. I, I would love in these days during the pandemic to be able to make more Swedish films available online. Mm, um, however, as you know, it's extremely difficult with mm. rights for films. So we, I also involved a colleague of mine at the embassy to try to get hold of the British uh, rights owners of, of the film, uh, The Phantom Carriage, which was uh, impossible because the company uh, doesn't exist anymore. And uh, Svensk film industry themselves uh, called they're called SF studios nowadays mm -hmm. they um, didn't uh, know what I should do about it and the Swedish version is no it, it's not available yet but it will be I'm sure it will be so, so yeah. has, has this restoration been done because of the 100th anniversary yes Yes. Ah, right. So it's the, just might... the very recent one and that's why I haven't seen it uh, and of course they they might not want to to do online screenings of that mm. version instantly, you know, they, they would probably be able to sell it to a new rights owner in the UK, for example, before that company decides uh, what mm. to, to do with the film. And but I'm a... sure we'll be able to see it quite soon. And I, I'm sure it will be beautiful because my colleagues, uh, former colleagues at the Film Institute are very excited about it. Excellent, that's so really I good would, news. I would say to you, Ian, that the legacy of the Phantom Carriage is great, really great. And it's such a well-known film and it's been so influential in the Swedish uh, film history. So, so um, yeah, it it's, it's, should be taken care of carefully and it apparently it has been taken care of. Mm. That's really good news. I was wondering, my, my first response there was to think, well, it, it hasn't been, you know, relaunched in, in, in a flashy uh -huh. way. Uh, it hasn't been recolorized in a flashy way as, as, as uh -huh. any of these classics have, but we'll see how this new version looks. And, and it's really great to hear that it's got yet another soundtrack as well. I mean, the other, to, to be slightly irreverent, we could say that the other legacy is that many people um, see immediately the likeness of uh, the, the, the figure of the carriage driver with Ingmar Bergman's figure of death in The Seventh Seal. And then he goes forward, doesn't he, into Woody Allen and Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure and a million Halloween parties. <laughs> so yeah. if you want a non-serious answer, that would be it. I would say Lu Lu Lucy's made a note of who's here. So, so um, when we know um, that it's available online. Perhaps we'll just email everyone who uh, attended this evening and we can um, just give a heads up and a reminder. Uh, so next I have a question from Eric Orlovsky. Hi, <clears throat> and hi Claire, thanks for the lovely talk. Um, I'd also like to extend a wave from UCL Anthropology. 
Oh, hello, you see, I like you. Yeah, <laughs> uh, no, I, what, what I thought was really interesting was the sort of, we've, I think we've largely or slightly touched on this so far, at least various aspects of it of say, the thing about like the kind of tuberculosis and the public messaging that goes into that and the kind of the religious undertones and even the things about say, the scenes around kind of, in the, you know, in the, um, uh, uh, in like the kind of hospital scenes where they're taken care of and the kind of poverty that's shown and the tramped drinking in the parks and, and so on. There's a lot of generally public messaging in that. And it kind of brings my my mind to that sort of intersection between the uh, the labor movements in the early in the early 1900s and the sort of uh, the religious movements that tied into that, as well as the teetotal stuff that all kind of came to a head as this one kind of meta movement in Sweden around about that time, which makes me think about like, do, do these movies, um, were they produced with any particular audience in mind? Was there a very particular target of like aiming them at say the working classes or at kind of the middle class or men in particular or however, you know, like, like so were they produced with, with anything like that in mind? And, or in this case, was the Phantom Carriage produced with, with any particular audience in mind? And was that kind of a standard practice as opposed to it's a two-pronged question in that case? Well, I mean, they're, they're produced first and foremost to make money, right? <laughs> to, to develop the film industry and, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. But Victor Systems, one of the many directors at, at the time who, who really does, I think, genuinely believe in the improving power of film. So you get, um, you get some ridiculous quotes from Danish directors saying things like, oh, when our films make it to the, the, the millions of Russians out there, they will learn how to put a crease in their trousers and how to eat with cutlery and, and so on. So that's, that's at the less, the less respectable end of the scale. Um, but, but yeah, very often there, there would also be, a, there was a very strong, um, it, it, I mean, so strong it was taken for granted assumption that the film did have a strong psychological effect and, and you know, did impact on kids' behavior and uh, could educate particular groups. So I think that the, 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 the kind of the, the enlightening mission in, in this case comes from through the, the Lagerlöf link rather than from Svensk film industry. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it, it, films don't appear out of nowhere. There are consultants, there are script editors, there are original authors, and all of them are going to have some kind of a, some, some kind of ideology, some kind of ideals, some kind of purpose. Um, that project of elevating Swedish film uh, to equate to theatre or, or, or to literature is, is, is part and parcel of a discourse about let's make film a good thing, let's make it an educational thing. I mean, the other thing I can say is that um, a lot of my research has been on mid-century public information films, and I believed naively for years that there must, there must have been efforts to examine their impact and to try to, to, to measure it. And in fact, there wasn't because this, this potential of film to improve people's lives was so much taken for granted that it wasn't seen as something that had to be evaluated as such. And what was, was that assumption kind of, was that localized to say Sweden or Scandinavia or was yeah. that just how no, I've looked, everybody I've looked made at, films assumed that was the case? Yeah, I've, I've looked at this pretty worldwide actually. Um, and it's, okay, you, there's something special about the Nordic region insofar as we can look at the Nordic model and we can say that film played a really important part in the construction of the welfare state uh, and the dissemination of welfare state ideas, for sure, you can't deny that. But if you look at the history of British public health films, um, I've, I've, you know, I've been to the National Archives, I've, I've looked through the committee minutes, people just assume that films are gonna have an impact uh, in ways that we don't, because as soon as we spend any money, we have to, we have to track and evaluate the impact, don't we? Yeah, do, do we know whether these things, like how effective they were? Like, I know that might be kind of a very broad question, but. Well, we do it in the sense that you can't, so, so um, let's say an anti-speeding film from Denmark in 1947 made by Carl Dreyer, yeah. which actually exists. Um, the, the Danish Association for um, Traffic Safety commissioned this film. Did they follow up to see how effective it had been? No. Could you? Yes, you could look at the, the, the motorbike crash figures for the next five years, but you can't separate out the, the impact of a film in that sense. You can, you can look at the, the total campaign 
So you can you you could you can't separate out the impact of the phantom carriage on tuberculosis statistics, but you can see it as part of a much much bigger network of educational films, fiction films, campaigning, leaflets, radio addresses, posters, going door to door, and inoculation um, and screening. So it's it's really really difficult to to say for sure what the impact of, of the film has has been. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. That was one of my little rants. <laughs> Does anyone have a counter rant or a, or a question? Um, I have a yeah, question. Yeah, we, we've got Beth, who we haven't heard from um, until now yet, who needs to unmute. No, Beth is talking, but needs to unmute. Beth Anderson. Unmute, unmute, unmuted. I don't have a counter rant. I have a, a, a kind of separate question about music and um, whether we know what the original score for the for the uh, release of the movie was, because the the version of the film that I watched had a very kind of spooky kind of synthesized sound behind it. But the versions that um, Claire that you had were were much more kind of um, I guess real instruments. And I wonder, I guess my question is like, how much do you think that that has an impact on the audience experience, the, the musical score? Oh, a, a, a huge impact. And I mean, we can't really understand it because we're used to films having sound. So, um, the, I mean, if, 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 you think, if you think of me back to 1920, the idea of films having sound embedded was as unlikely as if we were to suddenly find that films had smells. <laughs> films, films can communicate smell to us and then we fill in the detail from our imagination and, and, and that's how it worked at the time. Film art is a silent art and if you were watching The Phantom Carriage at, at your local little village hall or something instead of a big cinema, you would maybe have a piano player if you were lucky or, or it might just be silent. Um, but at the bigger cinemas, um, there, there, there would be an orchestra. And there wasn't, um, uh, as I said earlier, there, it was a mixture of um, classical music pieces not written for the film. And then Turi Rangström apparently had been commissioned uh, to, to write a few pieces. And that was quite typical. It, it, would, be, it would be a mixture. Um, and sometimes we know what the premier scores were and, uh, and sometimes we don't um, because it just gets lost. <laughs> but um, I would say though that you, uh, our brains seem to be very well equipped to add music into the interpretation. So I, I have a friend who plays in a band and occasionally will play in front of a, a backdrop of a projected film randomly and he will get people coming up to him later and saying, I really love the way that you synchronised people running down the steps to, to that drumbeat. And they've got their backs to the films, they're not synchronising anything at all. Uh, so, so psychologically it's a really interesting question. Um, the, 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 the difference between the, the, the clip that you played that had the, the soundtrack that you had on, which was kind it. of like pianos and trumpets, and then the, the same scene played with the, um, the really kind of like synthesized spooky kind of mm. sound behind it um, that's on the archive, I think. I don't know. I've, I, so I, I felt like, complete, like completely different experiences. Yeah. I was seeing the same thing. For understanding sure. the same thing but like my ears were hearing something different that made me mm -hmm. one made me feel kind of slightly like one made me feel made me feel more discombobulated than the other <laughs> well if you're using the word discombobulated i think you were maybe listening to the ktl soundtrack um, and then my, my clip had the matty boo one but there was also when i started teaching this film on vhs in 1998 there was, there was a just a random piano score that just went da, 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 all the way through. Um, and so when I saw it for the with the Matty Boo score for the first time, for sure it was a completely different experience. Thank you. And thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. Um, so on behalf of um, all the council members who are here and all the members who are here, thank you uh, very much, uh, Claire. Uh, we'd like to extend um, uh, complimentary membership for 2021 uh, uh, if you will accept it so that we can keep in touch and, and keep you uh, close to us w will you accept that as, as a thank you i would i would be honored thank you very much honored to join the club thank you very much does this make me an honorary suite 
it makes you an honorary Swede uh, and and um, and, uh, and, a, and a valued member. Um, and and if if there's anyone out there who has a friend or uh, who hasn't yet joined the Anglo-Swedish Society, if you do it now, it will last all the way until the end of 2021, and we're ever hopeful that we'll be able to get it, get together in person. Um, so thank you for to our, our sister societies, uh, Swedish British Society in. Uh, in Stockholm and Anglo-Swedish Society in, in uh, Gothenburg for, for joining in as well. Uh, and, and thank you all for, for carrying on um, to make the um, Anglo-Swedish Society live in these strange times. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lovely talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome.